So first we looked at the revelation of God's wrath towards the Gentiles or the nations as we just saw in 118 through 32 and that Paul says that because of God's testimony that's clear and constant through creation, mankind is without an excuse. Now Paul moves into the impartiality of God's wrath towards Jew and Gentile. This is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Now, Paul's not going to single out the Jew until we get to chapter 2, verse 17. But I picture Paul as kind of tiptoeing up on the Jew, saying things in this section that are about them, though he doesn't identify them until later on. We know that because Paul is looking at somebody who thinks they're better than the Gentile, thinks they're better than the barbarians. And because of that, they assume that they'll escape the wrath of God. Paul's going to show them that actually they're basing their hopes on something that will not sustain them. And so he's going to show the impartiality of God's wrath towards Jew and Gentile. He begins by showing the fact that God's judgment is inescapable. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore you have no excuse. Now, that should strike us as an odd statement because when Paul originally wrote Romans, there were no chapter divisions. And he just talks about the Gentiles. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 32. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do those same things, but they give approval of those who practice them. So he's talking about them, and he says, therefore, you're without an excuse. <laughs> that seems like an odd statement. How come I am accountable and I am without an excuse, even though we're talking about what someone else did? Well, Paul's going to explain that. He says, you have no excuse, everyone who passes judgment, because in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, because when you judge, you practice the same things. Whoever this person is, and again, I said I believe it's the Jew that Paul is sneaking up on. Paul says, when you judge the Gentiles and say they shouldn't do that, and you do the same thing, then by your own confession, you're saying, I too deserve God's judgment. I like to think of it as, uh, as it was with David and Nathan the prophet. Maybe you'll remember that story from 2 Samuel. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and God sent Nathan the prophet to expose David's sin. And so Nathan gave a parable. He talked about how a poor man had one lamb that was precious to his family, and a rich man had anything that he wanted, but he took the poor man's lamb for himself. And David was so angry, he said, that person deserves to die. To which Nathan responded and said, you are that man because you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to make her your own. By David's own statement, when he said that person deserves to die, he was condemning himself. That's what the Jew is doing here in chapter 2. They're pointing at the Gentile and saying those people deserve God's judgment, but they're doing the same thing. And so by their own admission, they too deserve the judgment of God. Verse 2, Paul says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And listen to how he's getting them to agree with him. He says, We know, you and I know this, we know that God's judgment rightly falls on people who do these bad things. And so these self-righteous Jews are not connecting the dots that they too deserve the wrath of God. I had a trainer that I, went to, that I uh, learned from in my missions training that worked with a tribal group in the Philippines called the Kalanuya tribe. And when this trainer was working with this tribal group, he asked them, he said, can you tell me what a good Kalanuya is like? He wanted to see what their standards of righteousness were. And they, they said, well, a good Kalanuya is good to his wife and he provides for his family. He's a hard worker. He helps other people. He shares. And they had this list of, of a good Kalanuya. And then he asked them, he said, well, can you show me somebody who's like that? And I kid you not, they said, hmm, we don't have anybody like that in our village. And I think it's interesting that it's so easy for humanity, for mankind, to describe what a good person should be. But Paul isn't concerned with the Jews' ability to describe a good person. He wants them to see that they don't live up to the standard that they would describe, that they too are common sinners before a holy God. 
And so Paul says in verse 3, he says, Do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment and you do the same thing, do you suppose that you'll escape the judgment of God? And of course they did. They assumed that they would escape God's judgment because they're Jews. They're not Gentiles. And so they assumed that even though they did the same things that others were doing, they were somehow sheltered from God's wrath simply from the fact that they came from Abraham's DNA. Paul's going to show them that that simply is not the case. Verse 4, Do you think lightly of his riches, of his kindness, his tolerance and his patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And so God isn't executing judgment on the Jews in that moment. They assume that all was well between them and God. Paul says, no, God is not judging you because He's giving you opportunity. God holding back judgment does not equal God's approval. It means an opportunity for the Jews to come to faith in Christ. And so God's judgment is also unbiased. And this is one of the most difficult portions of Romans, but I think it's also one of the most important ones. And so we're going to go through this a little bit slower to make sure we understand what Paul is saying. He says in verse 5, he says, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of God's righteous judgment. And so the Jews were unwilling to repent, and every day that went by, wrath was building up, and they would face that wrath on the day of God's wrath. And Paul wants him to recognize that this is an unbiased wrath. And so he goes into a section to explain this. Now, I want to go ahead and show you this. This is what would be called in literary terms a chiasm or a chiasm. It's a literary device that was used by authors in the Greco-Roman world, including the authors of Scripture, where they would frame a statement for the sake of emphasis. Uh, some people call it like a truth sandwich. And, and what Paul does here is he makes certain statements that seem to make no sense until we see them in their context. Paul says in verse 6 that God will render to each person according to his deeds. He says in verse 7, "...to those who persevere in doing good, that seek for glory, honor, and immortality, they get eternal life. But those who are selfishly ambitious and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they will face wrath and indignation." Tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Again, he says, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good. You see the problem with that? It sounds like Paul is saying that if you do good, you get immortality and eternal life. If you do good, then you will receive honor and peace and glory. It sounds like Paul is saying that you could have eternal life by doing good works. But you've got to remember that Paul is talking to the self-righteous Jew and he wants to shut the door on their self-righteous claims. And so Paul in essence is saying, okay, if you can do good and only good, you'll get eternal life. In other words, he's saying, let's test your theory. If you think you can be good enough to earn God's salvation, go ahead and try it. But be warned, Paul says, that if you can't be good enough, there's going to be distress for every soul of man who does evil, and God's going to serve the Jew first and then the Gentile. And so this chiasm, he mirrors these statements. God will judge all men equitably. All men are going to be judged impartially. Those who do good get eternal life. Glory for those who do good. But in the middle of that, as I said earlier, it's framed for the sake of emphasis. Those who do evil will suffer wrath. There is wrath for those who do evil. And Paul wants to make that emphatically clear to the Jew that everyone who does evil, be they Jew or Gentile, will face the wrath of God. The Jew thought that they would be treated with preference. And Paul says they will be treated with preference. There's going to be evil, or excuse me, there's going to be wrath for those who do evil. Wrath for those who do evil. And so they're going to be treated first. That's to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Everyone who sins will face the wrath of God. And that's the emphasis that Paul has in this chiasm. So here's what I want you to get. I want you to see that Paul is saying, in essence, everyone is going to get exactly what they deserve. The Jew thought they deserved to be treated with preference over the Gentiles. 
And Paul says, God is going to serve you first. And if you've done evil, you'll be the first to be judged. He's taking away their hopes of self-righteousness, and he uses a literary device called a chiasm to do that. I also want you to notice this next argument that Paul gives. He's going to show that God's judgment is based on deeds. This is the thing that the Jews were hung up on. They thought that because they were Jews and they had a higher standard, then just the possession of that standard made them right with God. Paul's going to say, no, it's not what you know. It's what you do that's going to be the basis by which you're judged. And so Paul shows us this in verses 12 through 16. Notice how he says in verse 12, he says, all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. You know that those who, who sin without the law, those would be Gentiles. They didn't have God's word. Those who sin without the law will perish without the law. He goes on to say, though, that those who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Now, years ago when I was studying Romans, I, I took a marker on a printed edition of Romans and I covered out every additional phrase just to get the gist of what Paul was saying. And I discovered this that really I think is profound. When you take away the supporting phrases without the law and under the law, here's what you get. All who have sinned will perish. All who have sinned will be judged. It's the same thing that Paul communicated in the chiasm. There will be wrath for every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So Paul's point is that everyone who sins will be judged. That's something that the Jew had a hard time becoming convinced of. And so Paul speaks about the impartiality of God's wrath towards Jew and Gentile. Look with me in verse 14. Paul says, When the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, they are a law to themselves. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, and their conscience bears witness, either accusing or defending them. Now, this is a difficult section here, but I want you to understand this because I think it's very important. Paul says that the Gentiles instinctively do the things of the law. Some read that and assume that there must be nations, people groups out there that are actually living up to God's standard. That's not what Paul is saying. When Paul says they do instinctively the things of the law and they show the work of the law written on their hearts, he's simply saying that all men have standards. And that was the issue with the Jews. They had a standard, the law, and they thought that their possession of a standard made them right with God. Paul said, no, it's not your possession of the standard. The question is, do you live up to that standard? In fact, Paul could say that everyone has a standard. The Gentiles, instinctively, they show a standard. They show the work of the law written on their hearts. And so possession of a standard isn't what makes one right with God. The only way one could claim that they were good enough is if they actually lived up to that standard. But if they don't, Paul says, there's wrath for every soul of man who does evil. And so in this section, Paul is not saying that one could be justified by their deeds. He's trying to bring the Jew to the end of themselves by recognizing there's nothing good they can do. He's trying to show them the bankruptcy of trying to be right with God through good works. It's not a possession of a standard or even an attempt at a standard. Only could they say they were good enough if they could live up to that standard. But if they don't, Paul says... They said, Paul says that God is going to judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. And he ends this little section with a note of seriousness that God who looks at the heart and judges the secrets of men, he's going to be the one to evaluate. And of course, that means that the Jew is left wanting before a holy God. 